Salam to all the men, all the women on your right hand side, all the jinns as well. Yeah. It's a true belief, it's a, it's a belief that is within our fifth books. But before we, we continue, I'd like to say if you have any uh, young children, if you have anyone who's young and um, or somebody who might be <coughs> weak-hearted, someone might be weak-hearted, someone who might find it uh, disturbing to hear things about jinns, and please go home and go to sleep. <laughs> <laughs> because we've, I've done this time and again. I've done this time and again, and uh, sometimes I've had youngsters. You know, they're, they're about. Doesn't matter what age they are, they all want to know about this. They all want to know about this. And when you ask them, are you going to be scared? They go, no, 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 And next minute, you know, the next day, the moms are sending letters to the school saying, you know, my kid's basically scared, he won't go to sleep, you know, on time. I mean, there's one, one particular family, talking about jeans. There's a whole family that were, you know, it was a social kind of event. Talk about it, there's some youngsters there. And there's some there that weren't, that weren't very young, they were teenagers. And after they finished, I mean, there was one particular family member who, who wouldn't go to the toilet on their own. You know? <laughs> I'm not being serious, you know, they would ask the mom to stand outside the toilet door, you know, and they'd be probably <coughs> like on the right side, <laughs> haven't dropped that yet. <laughs> um, so please, if there's anyone, I'm being serious here, if there's anyone, and don't, don't blame me afterwards if, uh, you know, they don't bring complaints to the masjid or something, you know, we had an event and we had someone, you know, who, who came and scared uh, someone. There was one particular person I remember once, they used to wake up the family for Fajr. And after they heard some of the jinn stories, I told them they wouldn't get up for Fajr after that. So they were waiting for others to wake up them up for Fajr. And they were hoping it wasn't a jinn. But anyway, um, the world of the unseen. In the unseen, and the unseen we only know through the Qur'an and the Sunnah. No person can know the unseen in its entirety except through the Qur'an and Sunnah. We have Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who has been very merciful to us to tell us what is happening in the unseen. Firstly, and most importantly, in the world of the unseen there is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That is the biggest belief that we have. And it overrides everything else in the unseen world and in the seen world. It's a very important part I'm saying to begin this talk. Because some people, they start to think about certain unseen creatures. And because of the belief is weak in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the belief in these unseen creatures becomes greater. That's where a big clash and a big problem comes. <coughs> Our belief ultimately is Allah is Qadir, which means He has power over everything. Our belief is Allah is Ghalib, which means He has He has His dominance over everything. Our belief is that Allah is the Mumit, 
Allah is the Muhi. Allah is the one who causes death, and Allah is the one who gives life. Our belief is Allah is the one who gives gives power to others to do anything besides Allah that has got power. It's only through the through the power of Allah. It only, it's only through the power of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And no one else, no one else has got any power and they will never gain any power without Allah's power. Now the Christian belief or some of the other sort of religious beliefs are specifically in the Christian sort of world that evil and good have got equal powers or almost equal powers and that evil and good are fighting and eventually they believe that good will override evil but they believe that evil has got a great amount of power we don't believe in that we believe evil is a creation of God so it's something that God created it's completely 100% within his power Nothing of evil, nothing of jinn, iblis, sihr, whether you want to say it's black magic or anything else in this world, can do have any effect except through the will of Allah. And it's very clear in Surah Al-Baqarah, where Allah talks about, well, Allah talks about sihr itself. If you look at the, the beginning of Surah Al-Baqarah, um, and, and you will find the chapter about um, Suleiman. Uh, and you will find there Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he talks about uh, the whole thing, chapter about how sihr sort of was there in the world you will find that Allah says وَمَا هُمْ بِضَارِينَ بِهِ مِنْ أَحَدٍ إِلَّا بِإِذْنِ اللَّهِ وَمَا هُمْ بِضَارْدِينَ بِهِ مِنَ أَحَدٍ لَا This is in Surah number 2, verse number 103. That they cannot cause any harm by their sihr or their magic to anyone except through the permission of Allah. Which means that when Allah allows these things to continue, they will continue. Not that Allah is... It's, it's basically like, have I got... Have, have I got the idhan of Allah or the permission of Allah for me to move? Yes, I have. You know, I, I, I can move. But when Allah, the idhan or permission won't be there, my hand will not move. It will be still. The same way has does physics works in this world. Well, it, yes, it does. You can get a ball, you can roll it down a hill. It will roll. But if Allah wants to, the ball will just stop. It won't roll. What does fire do? Well, it burns. And that's Allah's idhan in every fire that will burn. But Allah takes that Eden away when? When Ibrahim was in the fire, he took that Eden away. He took that permission away. So the fire, did it burn Ibrahim? No, it didn't. A knife, it will cut. And it will cut a sharp knife every time it will cut. But it, did it cut what? The throat of Ismail? No, it didn't. Because the Eden of Allah was removed at that time. <coughs> he didn't give permission for the, for the knife to cut. And thus, Allah's izn and permission is needed in all of his creation for his creation to continue doing what they want to do. And no one could move out of the permission of Allah. If Allah wants a sihr or something to work, basically every sihr, every black magic will just continue at its, at its normal pace. Except that if Allah intervenes or his izn is there or something else that he has created comes in between, then it won't have his effect. So our primary belief is that Allah is behind everything. Nothing, absolutely nothing can overcome Allah. Absolutely nothing. And we must stick very firmly to this belief because it's central to a lot of these problems that people have, whether it's with jinns or sihr or something else. That problem, mainly the problem is not with anything else but their own self, it's their belief. Their belief is weak. Now, in this whole thing as well, there's also the will of man. The will of a human being. My own human will power <coughs> is going to have an effect on how I confront the unseen world. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, His Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam has said this in Hadith Qudsi in Bukhari. In Sahih al Bukhari is there. Ana inda ghanni abdibi. I am according to how my servant thinks me to be. It's a very interesting hadith. Because 
Allah uses the word dhan, so we, we've got a thought about Allah, how Allah might basically treat me. Now, if I make my will power, and if I make my thoughts to believe that bi'ithnillah, with Allah's permission, nothing's going to affect me, then nothing will affect me. Because I have put my trust in Allah, that I, I believe Allah will deal with me in a manner that when I go to this place or wherever I am, nothing's going to affect me, then nothing will affect me. But if I have my thought about Allah, that, I don't know, maybe, you know, what's going to happen? Maybe it might affect me, maybe I'm not going to see, but maybe Allah, you know, might not might do this for me, or might, not, might do this, might not do that. If you have that kind of thought, then that is what's going to happen to you. The willpower of man and his specifically his belief towards Allah. Now we know Allah is not weak. Allah is al qawi He is He is ultimately, ultimately strong, meaning that there's nothing that can overpower him and there's nothing that comes in his way as weak. However, men's or women's beliefs can become weak. The weakness is where? The weakness is not in Allah. The weakness is in a human being. The same with the Qur'an. You know, people do ruqya, people read the Qur'an, people use it for protection, people desire it for kursi, and you know, we'll discuss this, inshallah, in today's uh, reminder. The weakness has never, ever been in the Qur'an. Never, never. People question it. SubhanAllah, people even question that. They say, how comes in the Sahaba time, and if you look in, in, in the time of the Sahaba, they, according to a hadith of Bukhari, there was you know, 30 different companions passing by a village and uh, there was a person that was bitten by a snake and they said, Hal min kum min raqin, is there anyone that can cure anyone, someone from snake poison? So the Sahaba said, okay, if we do this, what will you give us? So they said, okay, we will give you, they, they agreed to 30 uh, goats, I think it was. Uh, and then they said, okay, one of the Sahaba stepped forward, he went up to the person and he simply, he just read Surah Fatiha. He didn't go and get a book, Hocus Pocus, you know, <laughs> waving a magic wand or he just read Surah Fatiha and he blew onto this individual's leg and then the poison was basically out of the body. And the person was completely cured just through Surah Fatiha. The Sahaba came back to the Prophet and they, they, they now they were arguing about the fact that this, this Sahabi he had made a bargain. This was their concern. It wasn't, they weren't saying that, you know, why did he use Surah Fatiha for snake poison? Astaghfirullah, brother, we haven't heard a hadith like that, you know. <laughs> I'm telling you, there's a real big problem in, in among some, you know, half-learned Muslims, or book-learned Muslims. <coughs> they need a hadith for everything. They need a hadith for everything. It's true that a deen is based upon Quran and Sunnah, it's true. But you know, I say sometimes, you know, where's the clock in Hadith? Where's the clock? Where, you know, every day Zohar Salah, what time is Zohar here today? What time is Zohar? What time do you guys get up? 1? 1.30. 1.30, and I bet the Muazzin was looking at the clock. 1.29, one twenty nine, one twenty nine, one ten. 1.30, Allah, 1.30. Yeah? And all of you were sitting here looking at the clock. 1.30. And you've been doing this throughout the whole of the year. Where's the, where's the hadith for Sahaba or the Prophet or anyone thereafter sitting in the masjid looking at something, waiting for the time? <coughs> they didn't even look at the shadow and wait for the, for the time because of the, you know, they, they used to make their salat time through about the sun. But we use now a clock in the masjid. Every masjid has got a clock. Every masjid in the UK, Europe, America, most of the third world countries have got clocks as well. And they all use the clock to do salah. And that was something which was not seen in the Prophet time. Like, is it okay? Yes, it's okay for us to do that. But why don't people say, no, where's the hadith? And it's very important here because the argument of the Sahaba wasn't the fact that he used Surah Fatiha to cure someone from snake's poison. There is no sunnah regarding that. You can't find your hadith of the Prophet ﷺ curing anyone else from snake's poison through Surah Fatiha. But what they understood was that the Rasulullah would give them a, you know, he gave them a manhaj. 
which is a way. So here is Rasulullah who used parts of the Quran to do certain things like cure certain sort of aspects, whatever they were, and they understood that they too, as long as they followed the manhad, which is the whole system, they too could do that. They didn't need to inquire which exactly you know verses or whatever the Prophet was used for what thing. They didn't need to, need to do that. Yes, there are certain rukis that are very clear in the hadith, and we are going to use them. They're some of the best ones you can ever find. But the Rasulullah, the kind of ruqya he used himself, the words he used. I'm going to go through some of this today. And in the Quran, from the Quran, some of the actual uh, ayats he used, he used Qulad al Falaq, he used Qulad al Nas, and so on and so forth. Ilallah, 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 ilallah.